Kira na mehi nui kia koutou. En rau rangatira ma na mai hari mai whakato mai i tene hui mariko. A warm welcome to you all to this online seminar. Ko beri koutsaho ko te kairahi o te putea whaifakaro. I'm CEO for the charity Mindful Money. Nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. So, um, good evening. Uh, by way of background, uh, Mindful Money uh, is uh, sponsoring, hosting these seminars. Uh, we've got a mission to empower investors to invest in line with their values, as well as providing uh, transparency on companies within KiwiSaver and investment funds. We undertake these seminars and other activities to highlight how investment can make a difference on issues that matter. Uh, this is the 11th seminar in our series, and we did a previous series of 30 seminars. Um, please uh, check out our website for recordings on uh, climate change, net zero, social housing, impact investing, and over the last couple of weeks, uh, modern slavery. Um, tonight, we're talking about uh, investment funds engaging with companies to improve their performance on environment, social, and governance, usually termed ESG issues. Um, our panel's going to have a discussion for about 30 minutes, and then we'll open up for questions. Um, please use a Q&A button to ask your question um, uh, at, before the question time, but also at any stage of the seminar. And we'll, we'll come to, uh, uh, to questions as we go along. It's my great pleasure first to introduce Doug Bell, uh, from the New Zealand Superannuation Fund. Uh, Doug has worked with the Super Fund for nearly four years in its external investments and partnership teams as a senior investment strategist. He's been the strategic lead for a number of the fund's active investment strategies. And in the context of climate change, Doug's been closely involved in helping coordinate the integration of climate change analysis across the Super Fund's work. He's been a representative in some of the Super Fund's external climate-related collaborations, such as he'll talk about the Transition Pathway Initiative and the Sustainable Markets Initiative. And over the past year, Doug's also been leading the, the efforts in search of investments that deliver both a positive climate impact and uh, commercial returns. Uh, which is, uh, of course, nirvana for all of us who are looking for climate solutions. So a uh, very, very warm welcome to you, Doug. Uh, thanks for coming on the seminar. Good evening. Thank you, Barry. And uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so, well, thanks for the introduction. I mean, I, I might just talk for a few minutes, just to give you a quick um, sort of context Please. as to how we invest um, and how we think about engagement. Um, particularly my focus is, as you mentioned, on the climate area, so I will be a bit focused on that. Um, but I guess to, to understand how we engage, uh, the, probably the first thing to do is just cover off very briefly how we invest um, and sort of how we think about investing. Um, the portfolio, as many viewers will know, will, will be is around 58 billion or so dollars, <coughs> very large portfolio, um, certainly by New Zealand standards. Um, we do invest across a broad range of asset classes. Uh, we have a number of active strategies that we run. Um, and we invest, of course, globally, so it's across many, many geographies. Um, we invest into passive indices, um, so sort of share markets, if you like, around the world and global bond markets. Uh, we invest via external managers as well. So we appoint managers to invest on our behalf where they have specialist expertise um, in particular areas that we think can add value to the portfolio. We run a number of internal mandates um, and we also have a direct investment program as well. We invest directly into companies, often private or unlisted companies, um, and they would typically reside in New Zealand. So that those sort of a number of areas I and mean, we do a few other things as well, but that sort of covers a lot of the areas in which we invest. Um, now, the reason I'm telling you that is because, you know, when you think about climate or you know, engagement in general, but you know, climate engagement, um, it needs to be quite tailored as to the specific areas in which we invest. We can't sort of have one one tool that addresses everything. Um, so to provide a bit more detail on that. So international shares exposure, for example, a, a means that we we use or one of the primary means is we vote. Um, so we we express our climate change views um, through 
uh, the way in which we vote. We have voting gli guidelines on climate change and we vote on all shares in a consistent way. And we actually appoint a third party to sort of manage that because we have thousands of holdings, of course. Um, another important one is collaborative engagement. Um, you mentioned you know, transition pathway initiative and so forth. There's a number of engagements that we are involved in. Um, and they're really important because they provide some convening power um, in terms of a number of asset owners like ourselves and asset managers as well can get together. Um, in essence, we can partner up and we can go with or work with various initiatives to encourage specific companies um, and specific areas on their pathway to net zero. And that can be very powerful because you can actually end up aggregating trillions of dollars um, in assets under management to influence um, or provide influence across markets. Um, so yeah, a few examples would be um, CA100+, plus, um, Transition Pathway Initiative, Sustainable Markets Initiative, and so on. So a number of these initiatives that are underway. Um, and then for the external managers, we do work very closely with our external managers to encourage them to invest um, in a more net zero aligned manner. Um, and this approach has been evolving over the years. I mean, it's a fast moving space in terms of the understanding and the data that's available and so on. Um, but this can mean we encourage them on their climate related disclosure and encourage them to do more and disclose more. Um, we share our expectations and learnings in relation to assessing climate risks, um, be it physical risks or transition risks, so policy risks, if you like. Um, and more broadly, we will help them to shape their climate strategies if you know we can sort of provide some insight on that. So that's, that's quite a sort of key area. Um, and then, of course, in our direct holdings, um, we do engage directly with them. So individual companies and, you know, we can provide some examples of that if you'd like to uh, down the track. But that's that's another way in which we engage. I might I'll, I'll pause there. Good. Good. Thank you. Doug. That's uh, that's pretty, pretty comprehensive. Can you um, just just kind of illuminate a bit? So most most of your engagement is via uh, external managers. Is that correct? So, so as you say, you directly manage a relatively small part of the portfolio. So, in a way, you're managing other people to engage. Is that generally? I think that's the, yeah. The that's works? that's given the way um, you know, large portfolio. Half of it is equities or more is equities um, spread across the world. We need sort of aggregation power and and that can be through third parties for example who are able to do that we'll, we'll certainly instruct on what we're looking for um but that can then be um implemented through third parties and then um yeah we have a lot of uh, active strategies um are also through external managers so that th those will be um a primary area of engagement to ensure that they are doing what we would expect to do ourselves great thank you for that um, let's um, now introduce our second uh, panelist. Um, so it's a very warm welcome to to Iris Iris Tavila. Iris is managing director at, at BlackRock. Uh, most of you may know that BlackRock is is uh, the world's largest asset manager. Um, uh, Iris is, is head of the investment stewardship team uh, for BlackRock in Australia. She's a member of BlackRock Australia's board and the Steer Co. Committee. In the stewardship role, Iris is responsible for engagement and proxy voting activities in relation to Australian and New Zealand companies in which BlackRock invests on behalf of its clients. Iris is uh, responsible for developing and maintaining relationships with New Zealand and Australian clients and consultants um, for product development and business strategy. And she's previously worked uh, as a fixed income product specialist uh, for BlackRock and within the client business team. So um, with that, we're, we're thrilled that you're able to join us, Aris. So so very warm welcome. And uh, perhaps you can, you can start Similar to uh, Doug's introduction, give, give us a little bit more background about uh, uh, BlackRock's engagement uh, engagement work. Great. Hello, everyone, and thanks for uh, inviting me today. Uh, so as you mentioned, I lead our investment stewardship efforts uh, for Australia and New Zealand companies. Uh, I am part of a broader team, and uh, hopefully, as, uh, as you said, the largest um, fund manager, we also I believe we have the largest um, investment stewardship team globally. So we are uh, organized in a regional fashion. So I am part of a broader APAC team. 
uh, based in Hong Kong and feed into the larger uh, of global team, which is about 70 people. Uh, and so we, what we do, my day job, as I often say, is uh, engaging with companies. So what does that actually mean? It means meeting with companies that we hold on behalf of clients. I mean, I think it's very important. Um, Doug talked a little bit about their philosophy to think about our philosophy is, you know, first and foremost, we say we're a fiduciary on behalf of clients. And so the stewardship role is really important in, in fulfilling that fiduciary duty to our clients. And so what we aim to do is really to promote um, sound, uh, corporate governance practices at the companies that we hold on behalf of clients again, uh, and to ensure that they are viewing um, their operations, you know, their risk, um, their opportunities, frankly, uh, through that long-term lens, uh, because again, many of our clients do have that long-term perspective. Uh, so that's where we spend a majority of our time is meeting with the companies that we hold um, across our portfolios, uh, and then also, uh, you know, get involved in the um, voting at AGMs. Again, um, it's very regionally based, so irrespective of where um, a portfolio is managed uh, or where uh, what kind of style portfolio, and this is in the listed equity space, I'll need to be clear about that. Uh, the team, um, you know, so we, we vote all the ASX and New Zealand companies that we hold on behalf of clients. I might leave it there. Oh, and I would say the third part that we do like to say is part of our day job is is also, you know, in that promotion more broadly of that of um, corp, you know, that strong corporate governance principles. You know, Doug mentioned a little bit about Climate Action 100. I know you're going to speak to Lara soon. Uh, you know, it is trying to be part of that debate in a constructive um, way as well, which I'm sure we'll get onto. But I might leave it there. Good. Let me just ask you a follow-up question on um, that. Hour. So, to give people a little flavour of, of this, so when BlackRock comes knocking on the door, presumably companies uh, do do answer, um, given the fact that you have a strong voice as a as a shareholder. Um, What's generally the approach? Are you generally going first through a management team? Are you going direct to a board? Are you going through investment relations people? How 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 is that dialogue generally managed? And and uh, um, can you give us a flavour of of those? Sure, ab absolutely. Uh, it, it is a little bit geographically dependent. Uh, so I'll speak mainly to Australia and New Zealand, but for the Australian and New Zealand portfolios, the, the engagement tends to be with the board. Uh, and it's uh, depending on what the topic is. And we can talk about our engagement priorities, if you like. Uh, but generally, you know, the main conversations are with the chairman of the, the chair, I should say, of the board. Uh, and uh, in Australia, obviously, remunerations a very hot topic. So we tend to speak to remuneration chairs quite a bit. Uh, increasingly, uh, we are speaking to, um, as we do a little bit more on our on our climate efforts, which we can get into, you, you do start talking a little bit more to uh, a lot of the companies now have head of sustainabilities that are at the executive level. So we do a bit of work with them as well. But generally, it is very much at the board level, you know, with investor relations along along as well. But um, in different in other geographies, it might be a little bit more focused either on investor relations or, or actual uh, management. But we tend to our our philosophical view is that uh, stewardship is really about board engagement, uh, and it's not about necessarily micromanaging companies or telling companies what to do. Uh, you know, our investment teams, so they they're the ones that tend to meet with the management and are more concerned with the with the you know returns quarter over quarter, et cetera. So we we, we very much are more of a long term perspective, and and again meeting with boards. Cool. Thank you. We'll come come back to some of those issues and and perhaps some examples. Uh, as we move into the panel discussion. But thank you, Iris, it's great. So our third panelist, uh, let me uh, give a very warm welcome to Laura Hillis. Um, you've heard both of uh, uh, of our panelists so far talk about uh, Climate Action 100 Plus. Well, Laura's uh, the head of Climate Action 100 Plus in Australia. She's also Director of Corporate Engagement for the Investor Group on Climate Change. Uh, and they're often known by the acronym IGCC, um, uh, and uh, um, that covers uh, New Zealand and Australia. Um, in her current role at IGCC, Laura works with over 80 institutional investors in Australia and New Zealand and globally uh, to deliver a program of work on corporate climate engagement uh, primarily with Australian and New Zealand companies. She's part of the core team behind Climate Action 100 Plus initiative and the regional lead for Australasia. 
So Laura has previously worked in the insurance and banking sectors of both Bank Australia and Suncorp in sustainability and corporate communications. So Laura, uh, very warm welcome to you. Uh, thanks again for, for joining us. Um, can you give us a bit more of the uh, the, the background and the flavour, particularly maybe some some stuff about uh, Climate Action One Hundred Plus, which uh, which is obviously a collaborative initiative that is gaining a lot of interest. Sure, and thanks so much for having me, Barry. Um, I guess the first thing I'd say is just about IGCC. Your intro was very good. Um, so our name is the Investor Group on Climate Change, and we do exactly what it sounds like our name says that we do, which is we work with investors, typically large institutional investors on the issue of climate change. And so that typically means looking at it from both a risk and an opportunity um, perspective. So we know there are a lot of physical risks associated with climate change. The current flood situation in New South Wales and Queensland are a really good reminder of the really catastrophic um, damage climate change can cause. Um, and that's obviously of real interest to investors. But then the other part um, that we also look at is just what does um, the risk in terms of transition look like? What does it mean for the value of different companies or maybe different debt products like bonds? And how is that going to change over time as, I guess, demand profiles for different products, particularly um, energy intensive or emissions intensive products starts to change? Um, so that's a really key focus of work. And that's really where Climate Action 100 Plus comes in. So a lot of the work that we do um, through CA100 Plus is essentially um, helping investors to engage with companies on climate change. Um, so I'll give a little bit of background as to how it got set up because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, back in 2017, a couple of big institutional investors started to do the work of looking at their um, the carbon footprint of their portfolios and they realised that a relatively small number of companies accounted for a lot of the emissions in their overall portfolio. And so we came up with this list of a fairly short list of companies. It's 167 global companies now and essentially set out infrastructure to allow investors to come together as a group and then go out and engage with those companies that were um, really featuring on a lot of their lists as being quite carbon intensive and therefore um, seen as a risk. Um, it's worth noting ESG engagement and engagement on climate happens every day, all the time, with between investors and companies completely outside of Climate Action 100 Plus. But I guess what we've done that has been quite um, important and meaningful is that we've created those collaborative engagements, but also made sure that when we're having these conversations, they're totally focused on climate and we have a really clear set of um, asks that we ask for from companies. There are three key areas. And we also do an annual benchmarking exercise where we see how companies are performing and it enables uh, investors to have a really good check-in mechanism with how they're going with, um, with those engagements. So uh, yeah, and Climate Action 100 Plus, I think now is the biggest investor engagement initiative in the world. Um, it has over 700 investors signed up representing, I had a look at what it was in New Zealand dollars. It's close to 100 trillion in New Zealand dollars in assets under management from the whole group. So pretty big. Terrific. And um, given the fact that IGCC is deeply involved in the net zero issue, um, then presumably you've got a very close link between those funds that have made pledges under net zero and the actions that they want to take under, um, in a way, under their uh, their engagement obligations. Um, sometimes those engagement obligations aren't as explicit and quantified as the emissions reductions. Is that changing over time? Is that part of the role of, of Climate Action 100 Plus to, to uh, give, give more concrete shape to those engagement measures? To an extent, um, I think it's fair to say that that those two kind of programs of work, one is how do we get companies to perform better, reduce emissions, reduce risk over time that we do through corporate engagement, and then that work on getting investors to start, start to set their own targets and policies and frameworks has been a little bit separated. Um, but there is a real move to, to bring those together. And there's a simple reason why if you look at your portfolio and you have a lot of exposure to equities, um, you are going to be looking at those companies that you invest in and thinking, how am I going to get them to reduce their emissions, which is actually a really hard thing to do. And there's a bunch of different strategies you can use to do that. Um, engagement is one, a really key one um, in order to start to actually um, see how you can get them to, their, to reduce their emissions and set out specific targets. 
I would say at the moment, there's still not a really clear framework, but what we are starting to see is investors setting a net zero target and then putting milestones in place about where they want their portfolio companies to be. So for example, saying we want you to set a 2030 target that is X, Y, Z, that we want you to have a net zero commitment in place yourself by this point. And then um, if if companies don't uh, fail to do that, then they will take escalation measures or potentially decide to divest from the company entirely. Different investors are taking different approaches. Cool. That's uh, that's a really good introduction. Thank you, thank you, Laura. Um, let's bring the panel together. Uh, everyone's getting very good at turning their screens on and off. So, um, uh, thank you. Um, so, so that kicks off the the panel. I'm, I want to throw a, a bit of a challenge out to you all to to kick off with. Um, picking up on what Laura said, Laura said it's not always easy to get companies to change their policies and practices on climate change. Um, so I wanted to, to throw out the challenge of kind of how do you know that you're making a difference? How do you how do you know that actually your engagement work is working and that, that you are um, uh, helping and, and sometimes cajoling companies to go further than they would otherwise have, have gone? And, and Doug, I'll, I'll, I'll ask, you, uh, ask you first. And uh, obviously the super fund's got lots of experience around some of these issues. No problem. Um, and I've, I'll probably give an example of a, a manager in which we've we've sort of gone through that process with. So, we, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, we invest across a number of different areas, lots of different active strategies that we, we run. And one of them is is in rural and agriculture. And obviously, we know there's, you know, it's a big source of emissions. Um, you know, those, those emissions need to be tackled over time. Now, as, as an investor in that space, and obviously, New Zealand is a, you know, it's a large agricultural place as well. So we want to, you know, sort of try and improve the, um, the sort of practices. Um, we do make investment via a manager directly into farms. Um, and over the years, we've had a long-standing relationship with the manager over 12 years, I think it is. Um, but over the years, and or certainly in the last few years, we've been working with them very closely on building out sustainability practices um, and setting in place uh, sustainability pillars around um, this, the people, um, the animals, and the environment as well. Um, and most importantly, we were able to set specific targets uh, with the manager around that and measure it. Um, and so we've been able to observe year on year, over the last few years, year on year improvements across those metrics. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's sort of an area where it's, you know, we've had sort of, it's a good case study for us as to how it can work, um, particularly with our external managers. And so, we're, you know, we're looking to replicate those types of approaches across a number of different areas. Good, thank you. Good example. Iris, for, for, for BlackRock, you, you, uh, again, have lots of experience, and uh, but one of the things that that many New Zealanders have woken up to is is the power of investors um, being uh, perhaps uh, on the rise. So so the Exxon uh, AGM, where where um, uh, a number of investors in a way forced change uh, uh, against the wishes of management. Uh, provided a real um, warning shot, I guess, across the bowels of, of many corporations when a large company like Exxon uh, could, uh, uh, in a way, could be called to, to account uh, for, for their actions. Is that, was that pivotal for, for BlackRock? This is, uh, uh, or is it, is it a, an example that uh, is really part of a longer, a longer trend? I might I might um, put that into context a little bit Please. because I think there's two part there, there's two parts to it um, I would say so if we go back to sort of the beginning um, you know we spent a large part of our efforts um, in the engagement piece so it is you know meeting with companies and really trying to again uh, encourage them uh, and I, I think it's very important to say encourage them because we're not telling companies what to do but really to again. Um, provide that transparency and disclosure so that investors can then make decisions and, and allocate their funds in the way that they need to. So engagement's really important. And I think where, you know, to, to take it back to what Laura was saying as well, like, uh, you know, where the power of some of those collective engagements is that hearing the same thing um, from various investors can be quite a, quite a powerful force. Right. And so I think engagement um, is a tool that needs to certainly be um, not undervalued or underrated 
it. And it's frankly the one that we really um, believe strongly in. And so that's where we spend the majority of our time. Now, in saying that, um, voting can be also a powerful tool, but voting is only a snapshot in time, right? It's at the AGM. It's, you know, it's, it's, and literally what it says in annual general meeting. So it's one time, a point in time in the year that you can take a view or express a view on how you believe um, the board is managing certain risks. Now with Exxon particularly, um, you know, generally speaking, much like um, the Climate Act One, uh, Action 100 initiatives, you know, we've identified a climate universe and that climate universe is comprised of essentially 90% of the emissions that we hold on behalf clients, again, of our clients' portfolios. And so in that list of, call it a thousand companies, we've been fairly uh, clear as to what we would like to see from those companies in terms of their uh, road to net zero, as we'll say, and you know the metrics and targets that we'd be looking for. Now with Exxon specifically, um, that was a bit of a, a, you know, I think the reason it got so much attention was that it was not only what we've done with our climate universe is we've said, if we don't believe the transparency disclosure is there, if we don't believe this management of risk is there, then we will vote against direct Directors. And we have done that. And, you know, we have we, we these are conversations we have with our portfolio companies. We say, if this is not happening, this is expect this next action. Now, Exxon was different because there was an, an alternate slate of, an, of directors put up for nomination. Um, that is, I would say, a very um, rare thing that happens. Uh, and in, uh, you know, like everything, it's an idiosyncratic one that in that case, we what we did do, there were four uh, shareholder nominee directors put up for that. It, and we supported three of them. Now, why did we support three three of those directors? It had to do going back to sort of going back to basic principles in, in the sense that we didn't believe we we have been trying to engage with Exxon for many, many years. We didn't believe that the responsiveness was there or the movement was moving in the right direction quickly enough. And so, you know, after many, many years, uh, you know, the last resort after having voted out, you know, at several of their AGMs prior, we decided to support some of these shareholder nominee directors. Um, not all of them, you know, again, because we think about board and board representation, you know, holistically. So I needed to think about who who were the, you know, which candidates would fit with which, you know, board members we wanted to support. And so we ended up supporting three of the shareholder nominee candidates. But that was a very sort of extreme case. But it's important to contextualize in the sense of that was after many years of engagement, many years of, no, of progress not being made, many years of voting at AGMs. And then finally, that final step of, well, OK. Um, um, you know, we always say we have patience, but our patience is somewhat limited. And that is how I would frame that Exxon vote. Well, it certainly caught the attention of uh, of much of the world. It, it really uh, was the, the point of time at which people said, wow, this, you know, things have really changed. And uh, so so for that, I think it's a uh, it's a great example that uh, must be in a way, make make your engagement work much easier because, um, in a way, companies have seen the power that that investments can yield where where um, things are not happening. Um, Lara can attest to the fact it's maybe not so easy when you're in some of these meetings with uh, <laughs> with the directors who aren't very happy with you. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I can. Laura, do you want to talk about uh, some of your great experiences and <laughs> trying to talk to people who, do, who don't want to listen? Yeah, I mean, it can be tricky. I think um, probably my experience has been that we at Climate Action 100 Plus, but also at IGCC, are always trying to, I guess, tease out what do investors want from these companies and put it to them very clearly and succinctly and be very fair and upfront about our expectations. The challenge is if you're an investor and you've spent any time looking at the financial impact of climate change on your portfolio, you know that if we tip over 1.5 degrees, that's going to have a very bad impact on your investments. And that's pretty, pretty true across all asset classes and sectors. It tends to be more true if you're looking at things that are high emissions, particularly energy. That's a particularly tricky sector um, when it comes to erosion of, of value over time from climate change. So if you've done all of that work, you then tend to be thinking, okay, well, my expectations are that this company does everything that it can do to align itself with the science around what does it take to limit global warming to 1.5 or, you know, as close to under two as possible. And once you start to build out those frameworks for what that looks like and then present those to companies, that can be very awkward and difficult conversations. 
Um, you know, you're asking um, oil and gas companies to cut production. If you're if you're an oil and gas company that only um, generates oil and gas, that's your one revenue stream. You're asking them to completely change their business model. It is a really hard conversation to have. Um, similarly, we've had conversations with companies that are in a range of different sectors where we've pointed out to them that they might want to consider having more ESG or climate change skill sets on their board, given typically most of the board members are from the incumbent industry, which I think to date has been fine. Um, but one thing that we have continued to point out is that, you know, if, you're, if your business model has been in digging up coal for 30, 40 years, your new business model might be something totally different. You're probably going to have to consider not just um, having the new skills on that board, which I think was really quite instrumental to the Exxon vote as well, actually. It was about kind of getting the skills on the board that the company needed for its transformation. But it's also about change management and leading a company through a really difficult time as well, because we all know change is really hard. So, um, yeah, those conversations can be difficult. And if you're directly sitting across from a board member and saying, we're not sure you have the right skill set, you know, that's, that's a tough conversation to have. We, we constantly have tough conversations. So as a, uh, as a collaborative initiative, uh, dealing with some companies that have a business model which is inherently maybe wedded to producing as much fossil fuel as they possibly can, um, at what point in the collaborative initiative do you uh, can can you go back to your partners and say I don't think this is working, I don't think we're shifting the business model, and maybe we we should just divest from this company? Is that is that part of Climate Action One Hundred Plus mandate, or is it is a mandate to go as far as you can with engagement? I guess you could say the mandate is to go as far as you can. Um, the challenge is we don't hold the company. So IGCC, myself, anyone who's representing the initiative isn't the one holding the company. The investors in the room are the ones that hold the company. And so it's really up to them. And they all have quite different mandates as well. You know, I can be in an engagement mm. with a an, with an investor that has a very small um, holding in the company. Maybe they're more of an ethical investor. Maybe they have a very specific mandate to their beneficiaries. And then we can be in, in meetings with investors that have that own basically everything and have very, very different mandates. So it, it really depends on, on their comfort levels and, and what um, they need to do internally to manage those risks and to continue to do what they need to do for their beneficiaries. Um, but I think the only thing that would encourage, we talk about engageability, like whether a company is engageable a lot in Climate Action 100 Plus, about whether they should be continued to, to be engaged via our process and via our initiative. And the only things that would change that is if the company becomes privately owned and then the investors don't have a holding in that company anymore, so that makes them unengageable, or if we were just unable to find investors to engage with the company, um, which when we very first started the initiative, that was a problem. There were a few on the list that it was actually very hard to get investors to engage with because either they weren't signatories to the initiative or perhaps they were just not sure they didn't have the existing relationships and they weren't sure how that would go um, but to date we're, we're holding on to our engagement teams and I think most of them are quite committed to um, keeping the conversation going and taking it as far as they can go. Cool thank you and, and Iris for, for BlackRock there are particular issues given that BlackRock is obviously an index provider so so it's quite hard for you is it is it not to to kind of be disengaging or divesting from a company because you need to cover the full range on the index. Is that, is that correct? How, how do you do that from an engagement perspective as BlackRock? Okay, so I'd answer that in, in several ways. So the, you're right that the majority of our funds are held in index strategies. Um, to some degree, I actually think that that is helpful because, again, if we look at it through that fiduciary lens, and oftentimes the conversation we have with companies is, look, we do have that long-term perspective because we will be holding you, you know, today, we'll hold you in five years' time, we'll hold you in 10 years' time. And so the conversation is going to continue to evolve, and we're going to continue to ask these same these same questions um, time, time after time. Uh, so I think from that perspective, it is it is useful. 
you know, we do have active portfolios. And, and this is where I, I it, to some degree, I actually try to, again, use this as a carrot more than a stick sometimes, because, you know, you know, it comes back to a lot of, again, you know, that transparency and disclosure. And if you think about BlackRock globally, and even across our different um, equity holdings, uh, we said that we would be having sustainable sustainability as our standard for investment. So irrespective of where we hold you in the portfolio, whether it's index or active, we need to have some sort of sustainability lens when we're looking at you. And so many times I say to companies, this is actually us trying to help you make th this is an opportunity for you for capital allocation, because if you don't provide this information, then you're making it very difficult for your investors and you're making it very difficult for people to allocate money to you. So, you know, that is kind of the framework that we think about when we're talking to companies. Now, you're right in to say, and, and, and Lara will well know, you know, we are and, and the challenges um, that uh, she was discussing in terms of trying to form a cohesive view across a variety of investors. You know, again, um, we have many geographies, many different clients, and ultimately it's, you know, it's not our money, it's our clients money. And as you can imagine, they have very different views on how we should be investing and have very different views on how they how we should be voting. And I think one of the things that you might have seen at the end of last year, beginning of this year is as part of that, we have actually said to many clients, um, our institutional in index fund mandates, um, you can have that choice. Um, we'll, we'll give the choice back to you um, so that you can decide how you want to express your views and because it's not it's not our money. Uh, and so that does I think that has been um, the interesting to see what the uptake is going to be globally uh, in Australia, it's always been you know the superannuation funds themselves um, spend a lot of you know they have their own their own stewardship teams. They spend a lot of you know they're part of the Climate Action 100 cohort, so that's already a live practice in the Australian market. But it'll be interesting to to see how that evolves in other markets as well. I was really fascinated to see that from from BlackRock, and it must take a uh, a pretty amazing information management system to allow that individual voting. Uh, to be exercised by uh, uh, by a, a large range of, of different institutions. So, so uh, obviously there's, there's a lot of uh, IT power behind it. But is that? Do you see that becoming um, the trend for the future? Is that increasingly where people are going to be asked um, for their views on on how? Uh, they should be voting when they when they join a fund, or or will it go back to the individual shareholders, or or sit with fund managers? So I think it's very interesting. Our the ambitions are large, um, as you said. Mm. Technology and the plumbing currently is is the challenge. So uh, ultimately. You know, we operate under the ethos that it is it's not our money. So, you know, and we'd like to provide choice for clients in terms of investment strategies. Say, similarly, we'd like to you know provide choice for clients in terms of how they would like to vote. Um, ultimately, you know, the ambition is that uh, not just the mandate clients um, in index funds have that ability, but we could spread it out to the funds. And, you know, you can even see a, a day when an individual can do that because we do think that that is sort of the way the trend is moving. Right. Um, Stuart, you you know, stewardship, sustainability, um, at least from where we sit, where we see, um, is certainly very important to our client base, irrespective of where they sit, irrespective of its a mom and dad investor to the large institutions, right? It is incredibly important. And we do get a lot of, um, you know, queries and uh, both either asking how we're going to vote on things or um, wanting to know wanting to know what we thought about a certain vote, et cetera. And there are limits to what we can provide publicly at the moment. Uh, hence, hence the desire to actually say to, you know, empower our own clients to be able to do it themselves. And look, a lot of them are going to want to use, again, we've got a great large team. We have the benefit of being in different geographies. You know, I always say we have a Japanese team in Japan speaking to Japanese companies in Japanese. That's a tremendous adv advantage for our clients. Um, but some clients might want to do that themselves and that's great for them. And let's try to facilitate that as well. Yep. Great. Great. Doug, let me turn, turn to you. In, in your introduction, you talked about the Transition Pathway Initiative, and I know you've personally been very involved in that. Can you explain to the audience a little bit about uh, uh, what that involves, what the collaboration involves and, and uh, Superfund's role? Yeah, sure. So it's, yes, I mean, it's an asset owner led initiative um, that was commenced, I think it's around 2017 or so. Um, and the, the purpose of it really is to, I mean, firstly, you know, convene, you know, a reasonable amount of capital behind that to add some weight and to do some analysis. And they've selected specific high emitting areas as, as a starting point, if you like, and sort of working through that, do some analysis around that and assess the 
sectors and companies in those particular listed companies um, in terms of their carbon performance. Um, so how are they doing on in terms of actual emissions, but also what they've labeled as management quality, which I guess you could sort of think of that as strategic intent and, and how they're actually action in that as well. Um, and it's, it's a, you know, I've, I've had involvement through their steering committee for a number of years, and it's been a fascinating experience to sort of um, see how it has evolved um, and see how, you know, each sector requires very specific analysis, as it turns out. It's not, none of this is simple to solve, as I'm sure we're all aware. Um, but that specific analysis actually involves a lot of engagement um, with the companies. There's a lot, a lot of dialogue there and a lot of opportunity for comment around how the companies are being assessed. Um, but once they get to that point, they make an assessment, they then publish that assessment and they, they make it publicly available. So there's a there's a TPI tool um, and data that is available on this and it gets reported um, and it gets updated. So they have a state of the transition update. So you can see quite clearly how companies are performing based on this, you know, pretty independent objective assessment um, in terms of the carbon and their transition, um, which is, you know, are they aligned with a net zero transition or Paris objectives, if you like. So I, th I think it's, um, it's powerful. Um, they've also, they're doing work with FTSE. So they've, they've actually developed an index as well. And, you know, that, so that, that's sort of, you know, people can look at that and say, well, that's, that's investable. Um, so there's, there's a number of ways in which it can be used by asset owners and, and individuals as well. So I think it's a, it's a very interesting initiative and I think it's got some, got some good traction. Cool. So um, members of the audience, please feel free to ask your questions as we carry on through this discussion. We've got uh, plenty to talk about uh, so uh, uh, but but feel free to, uh, to to pose your questions Doug just on that so um do you have any particular examples where the TPPI's and inf uh, TPI influence has uh, you've seen been been particularly strong and and just the background of it I was really impressed by the super funds evaluation of your your engagement with social media companies particularly Facebook and and mm. to subject that to a, to an evaluation where you're looking at did we make a difference how far did we get how far could we have got what have we learned from it I thought was was excellent so so mm. is it do you do you apply those tools to other forms of engagement is that is that something that is useful Oh, is it useful? Yeah, I mean, the um, so I mean, starting with the TPI, they, they've um, there are a number of examples um, of you know various institutions, asset owners, and asset managers applying the data in a variety of different ways. So it could be um, what's known as ESG integration, um, where you take that data and you're able to integrate it into your analysis on companies. Um, so when you know specific asset managers are assessing the value on a company, they can take this information in, and it's sort of you know it can be consistently applied. Um, it can be around engagement. So you've got the sort of a, you know, a data point in which to engage upon and say, okay, we've got this you know, piece of analysis. Um, so I think, yeah, there are, there are a number of ways in which that can actually um, be used, that data. And, and a big challenge in this space actually has been data. You know, get, get in disclosure, get in the right data available and, and sort of being able to understand it. So I think it all helps. Um, yeah, no, I mean, social media engagement, it's, um, it's not something I was involved with personally so i can't comment too much on the on the individual aspects of it but i, th I think if you know taking a step back from that and sort of seeing it from um from where i sit it's you know it's, it's an example of where you can actually make a difference you can convene a group of asset owners and asset managers and directly engage with a company and sort of get them to sit up and pay attention so i, th I think there are definitely um there's, there's opportunities to do more of that. And obviously we have these initiatives that, that sort of help in, in that regard. Okay, thank you for that. Now, uh, panel, we uh, don't have a whole lot of time left. Um, so in, in fact, we're just pretty much out of time from what we usually do, but uh, this is a really interesting discussion. So if you can stay on for another few minutes, that would be great. Um, Laura, can I can I I'll ask each of you kind of to to do a wrap up and and it's really around um, where you see your work going in future. What are the what are the challenges over the next few years? What what keeps you awake at night? You know, where, where do you think you're going to get some some real progress on that? Laura, uh, you first. Thanks. It's a really tough question. Um, I think where we're going is those ambitions I was talking about on climate change, but also on other ESG issues are going to continue to ratchet up. I don't think governance is going to go mm. away anytime soon. In fact, I think the expectations on governance are going to go up substantially. What are board directors doing? Who's accountable? 
how do we make sure we hold them accountable? I think that's going to go up a lot. Um, what keeps me up at night, <laughs> I think, is the constant trade-offs that are that are necessary to make in this in the in this work. Um, and just because I think sometimes we, when we're doing, when we're having these conversations, sometimes something is commercial today, but it's not going to be commercial if you account for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years of impacts. And that is hard to quantify right now, but it's, that keeps me up at night because I can't help, um, thinking we're all going to have significant amounts of regret in the future about some of the yeah. decisions that are taken today that we can't necessarily see. Um, you know, we can't necessarily see the road ahead yet. So um, yeah. that probably worries me a bit. But overall, I think um, the momentum is headed in the right direction. There's some really great work happening here. Investors are, have, in, in my experience, also become better at engagement. Every meeting I go to, every month I'm in this role, I think, gosh, um, the analytics they're coming up with, the opinions they're forming, the questions they're asking. So I think the space is evolving and I think it's it's um, becoming more and more ambitious and achieving more and more every day. Cool. Thank you. Aris, same question to you. Uh, I agree. It's a really tough question. <laughs> uh, so I think um, similar to you know, what was said before, Climate's, climate natural capital more generally is going to be something that we continue to focus on and it is evolving incredibly quickly. Um, data, to Doug's point earlier, does continue to be a challenge uh, and uh, you know we spend a lot of time thinking about what are realistic asks um, to be making of companies and trying to balance off that again that ambition but also what's practical and pragmatic and and let's make sure that we you know that we are that we're again approaching everything with that fiduciary and financial risk perspective um it's going to be a really bumpy ride um you know i think particularly the next um if you think about the challenges that we're currently facing um you know in the energy sector the geopolitical tensions um you know trying to to balance off all the various stakeholders um there's some you know what keeps me up at night is um, look we're never going to keep everyone happy um you know it, it's almost like we're uh, might if we're doing a good job if everyone's mad at us at some point uh, because we are trying to be that sort of moderate measured voice and and again really think about things through that fiduciary financial risk perspective uh, so that's certainly, um, you know, it, it's difficult. It's a really difficult balancing act. But, you know, ultimately, again, we just really need to be um, thinking about things. Uh, you know, we always say, um, you know, this is this is a fiduciary duty that we have. And we need to think about everything through that lens. Um, more broadly, as uh, you know, we, we do update our engagement priorities every year in terms, you know, again, climate, very important, but it's not the only one. I mean, we, you know, similar to what Lara said earlier, like board is, you know, we always say if the board's not working and if there's not, um, if that responsibility and accountability is not being um, looked at, um, then the rest falls over. So we do spend a lot of time in that um, in, in that um, topic and thinking about board members and who, you know, who who are the appropriate board members for the various companies that we hold. Um, and, you know, the, I always will say the rise of S um, generally in the last couple of years is certainly intensified. And so we do spend um, quite a bit of time. And, you know, you mentioned Larry's letter earlier um, and in our previous conversation, but, um, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about the company impacts on people. So the human capital management piece, you know, your, your, your license to operate um how you know this the broader stakeholder capitalism piece so um we you know that's that it's a big focus for us um in our engagements uh and frankly in our voting as well so i might stop there because i know we're pressed for time yeah 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 just just a, a comment your your anchoring of a lot of your work in fiduciary duty reminds me that uh, uh you operate in a, an environment where you also have a lot of people including politicians saying that actually these issues should not be part of the conversation at all and uh, perhaps a little less so in Australia but uh, it's not so much of a problem in New Zealand and I guess we don't always we don't always see see some of those pressures uh, that, that come on from uh, from from people who would who would rather like to shut down this conversation altogether there's certainly quite a few that would like to shut down the conversation altogether. And, and again, this is why we always need to be very mindful of that fiduciary duty. And that's the lens that we're operating through because because you know there's been there's been debate on whether investors should you know investors should even have voting rights in some in some jurisdictions and so again um, you know it is trying to balance off all the all those various interests and 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 just ultimately just bring it always back to 
what you know what's our duty to clients what's our fiduciary duty to clients and and, and really trying to all of this you know larry in his letter was saying this is not about woke capitalism this is not about imposing values uh this is essentially this is you know long-term sustainable value creation for clients and that's the lens we have to always be thinking about great yeah he has a nice turn of phrase around around those issues um and, and Doug, to, to finish off with you and, and just perhaps to throw you a challenge that uh, since BlackRock is giving investors the ability to vote, will you give members or members of the New Zealand public who have a stake in superannuation fund an opportunity to vote on your corporate engagements and, and voting record? I don't, Barry, I don't think I'm in a position to commit on that, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking. Um, I think, I mean, you know, in all seriousness, no, I mean, we do try to be incredibly transparent at the super fund in terms of what we're doing and why we are doing it. I mean, obviously, you know, there are there are obligations around that, but we, we do really make a big effort to sort of um, share as much of our motivation and, and what we're doing with the, with the public as possible, recognising that the tax it is taxpayers' money. Um, yeah, so that, I think, I mean, just to sort of cover off a couple of the other points, I mean, you know, the, the I would note that the pace of change certainly that i've seen in the last 12 or so months has really ramped up in the financial sector um it's been a marked acceleration in 2021 uh with regards and i think a lot of that was the build up to um you know to cop but you know also it's, you know, data is improving tools are improving and we're really starting to see that come through from the asset owner perspective where we, we can actually use this stuff now and start to make better assessments on climate risks and opportunities when we're investing um, that's, you know, that's, that's sort of a very notable point. And also, you know, internally we've, you know, we're sort of revamping our sustainability strategy or our responsible investing strategy in quite a sort of big way, um, to reflect the changes that are taking place around the industry as well. So there's, there's a lot changing, um, a lot happening. I think it's, it's a very exciting time, um, because I think we have actually got some momentum now, um, and, you know, with a very strong basis for that momentum. So I think it's, it's hard for it to stop if you like, which is a really good thing. Um, I think there are a number of challenges, of course, and it's, you know, sort of keeping me awake at night is is around the areas of, um, I think, sentiments that record, echoed earlier is, is, you know, we sort of know there are problems in these areas, but we just haven't really got a, you know, the yeah. clear indication at this stage. We know that there's lots of other undue or risks in, in particular companies and so on that it's just very hard to sort of get a handle on at this stage. And we're going to be finding out and uncovering those over time, of course. But, you know, engagement is key. Um, data is is key around that as well, and sort of trying to improve our data. So, I think it's a, you know it's, it's got momentum, and it's and things are moving definitely in the right direction. Thank you for that, and yep. and I guess uh, for all of us, climate change is the thing that does keep us awake at night, and uh, uh, as a fundamental issue. Um, so, thank you all. Uh, I really enjoyed this panel discussion. Uh, you're a wonderful panel. Thank you very much. Um, Thanks also to our sponsors for this series, um, AMP, uh, Booster, Generate KiwiSaver, Harbour Asset Management, uh, PwC, and the New Zealand Superfund. Uh, and a special thank you to our audience. Now, I have an announcement on next week's seminar. Uh, it is subject to confirmation, but uh, as many of you know, Mindful Money has been active on the issue of New Zealand KiwiSaver and investment funds investing in Russian companies and Russian government bonds. Um, and there's a lot of public interest on this. Um, so we're doing a little bit of a pivot and we're planning a seminar to dive into the complexities of these issues from an investment perspective. That's on at the same time next week, we hope. So uh, please keep up to date with our website and register for that because I think that'll be a very interesting discussion as well. See you online then. Uh, Kakiteano namhi nui kia koto. Thank you. Good night to all.